Chapter 8, The Impact of Information Technology on Productivity and Quality of Life. Part 1, The Digital Divide. The learning outcomes include, evaluate the relationship between GDP and internet penetration, illustrate strategies to overcome the challenges of the digital divide. Let's start by defining gross domestic product, which is a measure of a country's overall economic output. Why talk about GDP in an information systems class? Well, GDP is one indicator of how far along countries are on the digital divide spectrum. The more money a country has, the more likely they are to have access to computers with internet connections, cell phones with searching capabilities, tablets for watching movies, and so forth. Thus, as GDP increases, the digital divide decreases. It's a win-win all around. You can see world GDP in this map. The darker the color on the map, the higher the GDP. Let's look more closely. The GD GDP is a measurement of the material standard of living and represents the total annual output of a nation's economy. As the map showed, the U.S. and other developed countries are doing pretty good. Over the long term, the standard of, the, of living in the U.S. and other developed countries has improved for a long time, although the rate of change will ebb and flow as a result of natural business cycles. For those of us here in the U.S., right now, this conversation doesn't affect us. But what about our friends and colleagues and relatives in Russia, Indonesia, many of the poor countries in Africa, and so on? What can we do to narrow the digital divide? And should we do anything? At its most basic sense, the digital divide describes the gulf between those who do and those who don't have access to modern information and communications technology. Why does it matter? Think about how many times you use technology and how much easier it makes your lives. Think about when your car breaks down and you use, you use your cell phone to get AAA to come and change your tire. Have a question for your doctor? You call on your cell phone and talk to the doctor or the nurse and get an answer within a day or two. If it's urgent, you go to the ER or to urgent care up the road. You have insurance and it pays for whatever is going on with you. Your high schooler needs to do a report for school to learn about the digital divide. How does she do that without internet access? You want to vote in the next election but it's a long walk to the polling station. It's okay for your social status. People don't expect you to vote anyway. Technology could bridge the gap between these situations, making the countries healthier through better access to care, safer streets due to communications between police officers and a reliable 911 system with GPS locations. Technology makes many things possible. However, we have to solve the most urgent needs, such as clean drinking water and access to food, health care, and safety, before we may, able, may be able to do a lot for the digital divide. The infrastructure needs to be put into place, and then the country needs to have a stable enough government to gear up. Private and governmental agencies already work to ease the physical needs of the citizens, and it's a slow process. Without infrastructure, most access will have to come through data on mobile phones. It's easier to get them up and running. They are inexpensive, and everybody knows how to use them. We will have to continue to do what we can do to bring others to the information accessibility we expect here in the U.S. The World Internet Penetration Map from 2013 shows that the U.S., Canada, Australia, and parts of Western Europe have the highest levels of internet penetration, with close to 100 percent. 
Deep blue is next, with many countries in South America, Eastern Europe, and parts of China. It goes down from there, with many countries having internet penetration rates well below 50%, which means that only the wealthiest citizens, and possibly the military and or government, have access to the internet. If you compare this map to the previous map on GDP, do you notice the similarities? Those countries with higher GDP have higher levels of access to the internet. Internet world penetration rates only reinforced what we just discussed, with North America leading the way at almost 90% internet penetration. That means most people have internet in North America. Europe, Australia, Latin America, and the Middle East all come in at over the 50% mark. However, look at the world average of 42.2%. That means that the large population in Africa has very little access, for instance, with the large population of Asia not much higher. There is hope, however, and it comes in a small device, the cell phone. Here you see the mobile penetration rates, which are slightly more promising than the internet penetration rates we just discussed. As we discussed, mobile phone is likely a better option to begin to bridge the digital divide. This graphic shows the number of internet users per 100 inhabitants. The blue line represents the developed world. The yellow line represents the world average. And the red line represents the countries below world average. Do you see the divide? It's pretty clear here. We can also see the explosive growth of the blue countries over the years and the very slow plotting growth of countries in the red. We're the United States and everybody here has access to online content, right? Well, not exactly. In addition to the digital divide between developed and developing countries, there is a digital divide right here in the U.S. While the offline population in the U.S. has decreased from almost half in 2000 to under 15% in 2016, that still means that about 50 million Americans do not have access to the Internet, don't have reliable, steady Internet access. Let's look a little more closely at who isn't online. We can see that 15% of women are offline, while 12% 12, while 12 of men are offline. That's not a huge gap, and it may not be a statistically significant difference, but it's an important trend to watch. 13% of white Americans are offline, while 16% of black and Hispanic Americans are not online. Again, this isn't a large gap, but it's one to track over time. The largest gap is between older and younger Americans, with over 40% over of those age 65 or over not online, while only 1% of those age 19 to 29 are not online. We may be seeing this gap because the younger generation uses smartphones, while the oldest group of Americans may tend to use them less, giving them no online access. My 81-year-old mom, for instance, wants nothing to do with computers. However, she uses her Kindle Fire like it's going out of style. She checks Facebook, reads books, and plays slots. It truly keeps her engaged, and for older adults without this option, they are left out. There is an income gap as well, with no access for 23% of those with annual incomes of less than $30,000, as compared to 3% of those with annual incomes of $75,000 or more. Since internet access is not free, except at libraries and schools, cost is likely a barrier to low-income families, especially for those who may be moving around frequently. Getting more technology access to locations nearer to poorer Americans is one option. 
The U.S. has tried to do that by providing access at all libraries, but we may want to put technology in community centers and churches. You want technology to be wherever people need it to be. 34% of those with less than a high school degree don't have access, with only 3% of those with a college degree or being offline. This is a large difference as well. Continued offering of a large number of vocational technical training programs could bring this group up, at least in terms of salary, and might solve some of the problems with access. Moral of the story, get as much education and training as you possibly can. Where you live in the U.S. matters as well, with 12% of our urban, 11% of suburban, and 22% of rural Americans reporting that they are offline. Some of this difference may be because of availability of internet in rural locations, although satellite internet has stepped in here and is doing a fairly good job. We will watch this trend to see if the gap narrows. Let's look more closely at some of these other issues and combine some of our numbers for a more meaningful interpretation. If we look at race, ethnicity, and isolation, we see that African Americans and Hispanics Latinos have made notable gains in online access, with Hispanics moving from 43% online to 82% online from 2000 to 2010. African Americans moved from 34% online in 2000 to 71% in 2010, and their white counterparts moved from 50% to 80% during the same time period. With this snapshot of 2010, Hispanic Latino Americans have shown tremendous growth and actually lead the way in access over their white counterparts in 2010, 82% to 80%. The upside to this chart is that all three groups have shown tremendous gains over time. We should continue to watch this trend and look for an updated chart in 2020 after the next census. Let's add race ethnicity to location, urban versus rural, and see if we can glean anything interesting. Across all races and, eth and ethnicities, rural populations have lower access rates than their urban peers. As more broadband, cable, and DSL access moves to ur rural areas, hopefully this gap will decrease. Rural versus non-rural Americans show differences in their levels of technology adoption. For instance, while 72% of U.S. adults in urban, suburban areas reported having home broadband, only 63% of rural adults supported the, reported the same availability. This may decrease as better high-speed options reach the rural population. Note that both groups were effectively at 0% less than 20 years ago, so the growth in home broadband has been explosive with rapid penetration into the non-rural population in particular. How about smartphones? While 77% of non-rural Americans reported they had one, only 67% of rural Americans had a smartphone. This number may continue to decrease as technology adoption rates increase among older and elderly Americans. 51% of suburban Americans have a tablet with only 43% of rural Americans. You don't need a tablet to access the internet, but this IT artifact has grown in popularity over time. If price for popular tablets like the iPad continue to go down, we may see more penetration into, this, into underserved populations. In the mid-2000s, 74% of non-rural and 61% of rural American adults had a desktop or a laptop. And in 2018, those numbers increased to 78% and 70%. Since most people already had a laptop or desktop, those numbers did not show the steep increases we saw in other areas. As desktop computers continue to decline in popularity, we may continue to see a leveling out of the statistics. How many of you have a desktop computer at home? I have one. 
In fact, I think there's another one in my husband's office. But as I work at home, like I'm doing right now, I sit on the couch in the living room with my laptop. It's simply more comfortable than my office chair. Now, I don't have others around that distract me in the living room or else I might move back to my home office in the sitting area of my bedroom upstairs. Or if I need dual monitors, I also might go up there. More likely, I'll turn on my Surface Pro 2 or my iPad or my iPad mini and use one of them as a second monitor. We already knew that older Americans were less likely to be online. If we look more closely, however, we see a distinct link between age and income. A person of any age with a higher income is more likely to be online than a person of any age with a lower income. Further, this statistic from the 2010 census shows that education and access levels have been linked for quite some time. This statistic shows that 90% of Americans with a bachelor's degree or higher had internet access, while less than half of households with a less than high school education had access. We know that Americans with higher income have more access and that Americans living in non-rural areas have more access than their rural peers. But let's look at income and location together. As household income increases, the level of internet penetration decreases accordingly, as shown in this chart from the 2010 census. Similarly, when comparing income and location, we find that those with higher incomes who live in non-rural areas tend to have higher adoption rates than those who don't. Moreover, this is true at every level of income. If you live in rural areas, you are less likely to have access, and if you make less money, you are less likely to have access. The two variables are clearly related. Finally, let's look at education and location together. Those with a college degree have the highest access at 88%. That's not very different from college graduates living in rural areas with 87% having access. As you move down in education level, the gap widens a bit with those with no diploma having urban access rates of 59% and rural access rates of 52%. We have shown that there is a digital divide in the United States. But we haven't shown that you can look at one variable in isolation as we structure plans to address the issue. You can't look at sex, race, ethnicity, age, location, education level, or income, or any other variable in isolation. What matters is a clearer picture of all of those variables together, and then seek ways to narrow the digital divide in the U.S. and across the world. This quote, published by the White House after the 2010 census, sums it up nicely. Why does this matter? Older, less educated, less affluent, and rural populations have fewer choices and slower internet connections. It's not just the government that needs to act, however. Nonprofit and non-government organizations, as well as local churches and community centers and schools, need to find ways to reach those people who are, frankly, sometimes difficult to reach. We can't email them, after all, because they don't have access to a fast, stable, reliable internet connection. And they can't have access until we address the problem. We are clearly working on this problem and have seen gains over the years. Let's hope that those gains continue. To summarize, GDP measures a country's standard of living and is also correlated with internet penetration rates. The digital divide exists between developed, less developed countries and within countries, including the U.S. New information technologies can be used to reduce the digital divide most likely the cell phone.